when he's on his way back to me, I rush for the door and he rushed and pushed the door so the door slammed. He raised me back against the wall, put the gun to my head and he said, if I can't have you, nobody else can. But get me out of the street and get a wall away from me. Raised me back against the wall, put the gun to my head. My father yeah. didn't care, you know. But yeah, I was straight here, so they had to drop it out of freaking school. They told me that they charged him with a rock, they kidnapped him. They leave that position of fire. Man. My name is Trish, and this is my story. So Trish, tell me a little bit about yourself. You know, um, the type of person that you are. Who are you as a person, basically? I'll consider myself a genuine person. Yeah. I'm very loyal. I'm very honest. And I love hard. Okay. Which parish are you from in Jamaica? Ocheria Sinans. What was living like in Jamaica for you? Oh, <laughs> that's some fun time. <laughs> living, life, living life in Jamaica for me in my earlier, early teens and early 20s. It was fun. Um, I'm always just jovial person, you know, and I have my daughter when I was young, so I feel like that's where my drive came from. Yeah. You know, I was just, I'm a single mom, so. How many kids do you have? Two. Two kids? They're grown now? Oh, yes. <laughs> my daughter is 25, mm -hmm. and my son is going to be 18. Wow, big kids. Yes. Very big kids. At what age you leave Jamaica? I left Jamaica when I was around 23, 24. How many years that? Oh, that's, that's a lot of years. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah? That's a lot of years. So when you leave Jamaica, where did you go? To the Bahamas. What made you leave Jamaica though? Like, what was in your mindset at the time? So before I decided that I was going to leave Jamaica, I was working at this hotel called the Jamaica Grand at the time. And I left on vacation to visit the Bahamas. So it was a group of us and we went to the Bahamas and we had a blast for a week. And um, while I was there, I met my son's father on that vacation that I was on. So at that time, I didn't know he was going to become my son's dad or my husband because we were married also. He was the reason why I keep visiting the Bahamas back and forth because after we met, we communicate mm -hmm. and um, go back to Jamaica. We, we miss each other. We're talking all the time on the phone. So, you know, by visiting back and forth, I've, I've decided to stay. Stay in the Bahamas? Yes. What was life like in the Bahamas? Um, after you decided to stay? After I decided to stay in the Bahamas, life, as, as in life in general, you have your struggles and your ups and downs. You're relocating, so it's a new, new for you. You know, you get homesick. You want you miss your family. You miss the lifestyle that you used to back home. Mm -hmm. So you're in a different <clears throat> country living a life where you don't know nobody. The <laughs> only person I know right. was is my... Um, kid's dad at the, you know, at at the, the time. time. How many years did you spend in the Bahamas? Um, I would say more than 11 years. Yeah. They called me a behavior now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. you, know? you know, I visited the Bahamas myself and um, when I was back in high school, mm -hmm. never liked it. All them three Jamaicans yeah. at the time, mm -hmm. all people run and hide and them thing there for me and never really liked it. Yeah. And I spent about six months 
Let me tell my sister, say, oh, I'm cutting up, come, can't deal with them things, you know. Right. You know what I mean? You know, immigration look for people and all these things. Well, immigration look for you if you're illegal. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was. Right. <laughs> Then give me so, a week, then give me a week and tell the truth, the time more than a week. Yeah, it was my experience there. It wasn't easy as a Jamaican because, you know, as far as the females there, they really don't like us Jamaican women because they have a saying, say, we, we, we come to take their man, right? Mm -hmm. So we cook um, stew peas and, and carrot juice and then <laughs> that's how we take their man. <laughs> so it Is wasn't that easy. True? Um, I guess people talk because they experience it. Yeah. For me personally, I feel like Bahamians kind of put um, everybody from Jamaica in this little box where if one person messed up, they have all Jamaicans as the same. Yeah. And ev wherever you go, people are different. You know, everybody's different. So I think they would use one bad experience and just... That's true. That experience for everybody. What made you leave the Bahamas? What made you want to come to the United States? You know, when I moved to the Bahamas, I didn't really know anyone. It was just my ex-husband now. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> we went through a divorce. And I realized like... After I, how many years? Um, Nine. Nine years? Nine years of marriage. Mm -hmm. We got divorced. And I realized... There wasn't much exposure when it comes to a lot of things there. And I'm a wild person in terms of I like to explore. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to grow my kids in that bubble. Okay. You know, I want them to have opportunity and stuff like that. So when I divorce, I choose to move to America with my kids. So right. I can, you know, ha have a better life, not for myself, but also for them. Right. So that's the main reason. Walk me through the journey. I mean, coming here, oh, you know, right, right. <laughs> um, what the thought process was like and how you settled in, you know, coming here for the very first time. How that, walk me through it. It was not an easy journey. Mm. Trust me. I feel like I never really know what hard life is until I came here. Came where? in the United States. Mm. Um, everybody has struggles in their life and right. stuff like that, but I feel like my struggles were harder for me moving to the US. Mm. And remember, it's not only me, it's me and my two kids. Oh, so, so you're, you're bringing two kids with you at um, one time. Yes, because they're my handbags. I'm not going to leave them. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> and you know, so I feel like that even make it even harder you know so after i get divorced i decided to move here with my kids i have everything i had everything planned out prior to moving here so when i came here as i said i have everything planned out um the person that was there opened his door like he offered like I, I live alone you know he even went ahead and bought another car so I have access to transportation to get around and stuff like that so he wasn't a stranger we grew up basically together in Jamaica so I call his mother mom <laughs> you know I was close to his sister his kids so I was no we were no strangers so okay. I feel like this is somebody that I could trust. And the funny thing about that is like when I moved and I came, it wasn't no type of relationship with me and him. Like, okay, this is what we agree on. Um, you're gonna be my woman and I want you to move in. There was no conversation of that sort. You know, I was just coming out of a divorce from my ex-husband in the Bahamas. So he knew all of this. He knew I wasn't ready for right, anything. Right, right. I just want to rebuild my life and focus on that, you know? So me coming to America to start a new life and this person aware of that, he knew all of that. Right. And have me in his home, me trying to 
better myself and he tried to take away every opportunity that I come across. Like sabotage, basically. But why would he though? Because he want me to want, he want me to rely on him or he want me to need him in a sense. Did you guys have a relationship as I other said, than a friendship? As I said, <laughs> we have no sexual relationship. And there, this was made clear yeah. before you come where mm -hmm. he's at. Mm -hmm. It all started when, you know, when I went there, it's like I'm always home. So I started to feel homesick. And I'd be on the phone more with friends back in the Bahamas or my sister here. So majority of the time when he would get home, he would notice I'm on the phone and not giving him the attention that he expects to get. And then I remember one particular night, it's around like, uh, seven o'clock in the evening I was outside on the car that he bought that I could use and I was basically talking to my sister he came from work he passed me he went inside he come back out he was like what's up you're good everything good you know I was like how was your day everything good whatever fit the basic the normal you know he went inside after we had a little conversation and then 30 minutes later he came out and said he's going to ride to the gas station, literally down the street. So he went to the gas station, he came back and I was still on my sitting on the back of the car on my phone. Right. There's nothing else to do. I don't know nobody. Exactly. Right? So he passed and he was like, my girl, you're still up on your phone. So I was like, I ignore him because I didn't take it as anything period. So he went inside and I would say probably 50, 40, 40, 50 minutes after I got off the phone because I want to use the bathroom and I went to open the door and I realized the door was locked. And how the house set up, I'm going through the garage to the, to the side door so I can hear someone is in the shower. So I went to the, the window outside and knock on the window and I was like, do you realize you locked me out? He didn't respond. So I literally stand in the garage until I hear the shower stop. So he came and he opened the door. When he opened the door, I walked behind him down the hallway in the room to go get my charger out of my, the room that my daughter was staying in. So while I'm bending down to plug out the charger, get up and turn around, I bump into him. Like, what's going on? You know, he was like, my girl needs to talk to you. So I said, okay. Still wasn't thinking anything, you know, because I was like, oh, no. What do you want to talk to me about? Probably something wrong at work or whatever. Right. These are the thoughts that was going on in my head. So I went into his room. And I sat on the opposite side of his bed. He said, a fool a tech man for. So I was like, a little taken back, as in, in my head now, and I was like, what are you talking about? He said, my girl, I come from work, you said, I'm going to do a punk car all this time. And you're not to acknowledge the facts that me come, you know, they showed no food for me. You know, you know, you know, asked me. I said, we have a little conversation when you came in. I was like, I said, what's going on? Because this is not about <laughs> what you making it seems like it's about. So I said, you have an issue? I mean, we could discuss it, but you have to lower your tone. Because he was really aggressive talking to me. And I, I, I don't like that. So when he's aggressive or anyone aggressive with me, I go quiet. So him being aggressive and 
the stuff that he was saying, to be honest, I kind of blocked him out because I was like, in my head, I was like, this is not necessary or I don't see the reason for this. So he's talking and I'm not being receptive to what he's saying. So that kind of trigger him more. Right. All I can remember is, he just rushed from the side he was standing on, come around to the side I was and picked me up off the bed by my neck, braced me against the wall. I was like, what the fuck is going on? My girl, look, 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 look in the wall, like all these dents in the wall. Bitch's head is, or, or face or whatever would be in this wall, you want this one. So in that time, when he braced me against the wall and he was talking, now I'm looking at him, and this person was not the same person. And that's how close he was in my face. And I was like, what's going on? He was, shut up your bumble clad. This woman aim was pretty much straightforward and simple. But somehow this brother seems to get it twisted in his head. But you know what I can't seem to understand? Because me see it happen right across the board with some people and some family members. Why when we say we are going to help a person in or out of a situation, we have to take disadvantage of them? Why? When we not take disadvantage of them, we try to manipulate them in some kind of way. When we not manipulate them, we treat them bad or push them around and hold them hostage to some kind of promises we made from the very first time and say, if you don't do this, if you don't do this, me not do that. Where is the genuineness of doing something from the heart? Or where is the willingness of doing it with no expectations or nothing in return? Where is it? It seems like Foreign countries have a thing or an effect where it changes people into monsters against their very own. Sometimes your own pitney, your own aunt, your own brother, some kind of relative, it changes us into monster against them. We need to stop it. If we're going to help a person, help the person genuinely with no expectation returns. If you can't help the person and you decide you make that agreement that you're going to help the person, just help the person and stop looking for things in return. Why can't we just do it from the heart with nothing in return? We need to stop this. We need to. Because that's how close he was in my face. And I was like, what's going on? He was, shut up your A fool a tech man for. And he just running on with me, never pick up his food when he come in, never they should play it, never acknowledge him. Me have man, me have my phone all this time I talk to man. But this brother delusional because him. you never establish a relationship with him. He might help you. Mm -hmm. So in a theme head, where him get that idea from? Mm -hmm. So when he was talking all these things and I was like, <laughs> at that time though, I'm scared because I was like, I don't even know what to say because I don't want to say nothing to, for it to get worse, you know? Right. So I was like, I don't understand what's going on with you. And I don't understand what all of this is for. So he let me go. And he walked back around the side of the room that he was standing on. And he went into his drawer and he picked up his gun. When he's on his way back to me, I rush for the door. And he rushed and pushed the door. So the door slammed. He braced me back against the wall, put the gun to my head. And he said, if I can't have you, nobody else can. One man can't say like delusional, yo. How you mean by if you can't have her, nobody else can? Brother, you're never in a relationship with the woman. How the f you reach to that part? 
where you even a back gun to the woman's head. Brother, I saw you did want, you never have a woman before. You never did get no pum pum. You did shot a p***y. Because pum pum are sitting where you could go buy. The woman just had come out of a divorce and the woman make it clear so she do not want a relationship. She just needs some help. And you convince the woman to come amongst you. You and the woman group together, brother. You and I group together. And you gotta tell me, say, yo, the woman come amongst you for some help. For you to guide her and push her. And you treat her that way. You about gun at the human head, brother. Man like who enough for that road. Man like who enough for have woman none at all. When you go there with dog and goat and cow and them sitting there, brother. One man can't so f***ing delusional. Hmm. At that time, I already made up my mind to die. I said, do what you have to do. That's, that's the only thing I said. So literally, a few minutes after that, I hear my daughter coming in and hollering, mommy, mommy, mommy. Like, because they're still not aware of what's going on. Yeah, Tennis, don't come in here. Yeah, I'm saying if it come in here, and because of the aggressive tone that he was using with her, she knew something was wrong. Right. So she forced the door open. She said, you can't tell me something if it come in mother in here. So she was like, what's going on? So I said, Everton just pulled gun into my head. So he gonna take life out of me, basically, if we can't have any way. So she was like, what's going on? He was like, don't ask me a question. Don't ask me a question. So my son hear the altercation now. So he come down the hallway and he was standing behind her. So he was like, what's going on, mommy, you okay? So she repeat what I told her to him. And he was like, y'all need to come out of my clad place. So, my kids and me, we walk out the room and we go outside and I said, I want to call the police. And my phone was still in his room. So I turned back to go get my phone. And the kids behind me walking in the hallway to get the phone to call the police. He took my phone and he smashed it. Wow. So my daughter said, I'll call the police. If you call the police, make sure you say you have some of your buckets there and all these things. I go call. He say, I think he said he gonna call somebody so we can get deported back home. Mm -hmm. All these things he was saying. So by that time, my son went outside to the neighbors to ask them if they could call the police. They didn't. They tell him they're not getting involved. Remember, I don't know nobody there, you know? <clears throat> right, because I mean, and you just, you just yeah, got there. I got there August, and all of this happened literally three days before my son's 13th birthday. Which was in... Um, October. October. Mm -hmm. So, he ended up leave. He left, and when he left, you know, um, my daughter called the police. The police came, we told them what happened. Apparently, they told us that we have to get up out of there and whatever. They asked if I have anywhere to go. I said, no. Um, but what about the family members that you were in contact with? They were in Maryland. I'm in Florida, they're oh. in Maryland, oh. right? So I, I didn't even call my siblings here in Maryland right. because at that time, I was just trying to figure out how to get my kids safe, you know? One of the police officer, he said, this is your car. I said, no, it's his car. So by that time, we didn't know that the four tires on the car that he bought for me to use. He didn't really buy the car for me, but he bought it because he only had one car and he knew I want to get around. Right. His neighbor was leaving, so he bought the car from the neighbor just so I could have something to get around. Right, right. So he... he 
punched the four tires. Then slashed them. Mm -hmm. On the car. So we never really knew that the tires were slashed. So it so happened that like, hey, the end of the day, all the cash I have on me, I use. My card, when he took my phone and smashed it, I was looking for my card because I have something like this with like a wallet. Right. So my cards and ID and stuff was in there. And I couldn't find those when he took the phone and smashed it. So we end up staying the night there. The, the police officer was like, I don't have nobody to call. I don't have no more, more money to go rent, no, no more cash to go rent no place. Mm -hmm. So he was like, if you comfortable staying here, whatever the case is. So I was in my daughter's room. He came back in the night. He came back after the police and leave. Mm -hmm. And he came and he, he took up his internet box. He um, went outside and turned off the breaker for the electric. And he put some clothes in his car. Why was he behaving like this? And he left us there in the dark. So we stayed in the, in the dark because we don't have nowhere to go. We walked down the street asking people for help. They refused to help us. I remember when we, when we was going to this man house. He all he's a Jamaican man, so he always like brings Cersei to the house and gives to him or Aki or all these things. We call him Walk and Talk. So when I went to Walk and Talk house, I said Walk and Talk. He he said, get from my door. I'm not getting involved. When he closed his door, 